So today I want to tell you about um, some of the extraordinary things we are experiencing um, these days in both academia, business and industry. So think about it. Today, doctors can connect with patients and teachers can connect with students that are thousands of miles away. We have robots that help with packing in factories. We have 3D printing that uh, creates customized goods. And we have network sensors that monitor uh, facilities. We are surrounded by a world of opportunities. And these opportunities will only get bigger as we imagine the impact of the latest and greatest AI and robotics technologies. So picture, uh, picture this. Picture a world where routine tasks are taken off your plates. Now, garbage bins take themselves out, and um, automated infrastructure ensures that they disappear. And uh, food gets delivered to your doorstep, uh, doorsteps. Fresh um, uh, fruit and produce uh, gets delivered by drones. And intelligent assistants, whether embodied or not, uh, help you optimize all aspects of your life to ensure that you live well and you work effectively. How are we going to live in this future? And what are the, um, uh, what are the, the supports for taking us to this uh, future? Now, AI provides support for cognitive tasks by providing autonomy at rest and support for physical tasks by providing autonomy in motion. And I would like to talk about these two topics uh, for the rest of the talk. Um, together in the future, these technologies have the potential to eliminate traffic accidents, to better monitor, diagnose, and treat disease, uh, to keep your information private and safe, uh, to ensure that people connect uh, and communicate instantaneously, no matter what language uh, they speak. Um, in general, to take care of the routine tasks um, and leave people to focus on uh, critical thinking, strategic planning, the kind of thing all of you guys like to do. Now, progress in these areas is enabled by three interconnected fields. Robotics puts computation in motion and gives, the machi uh, gives machines the ability to move. Artificial intelligence uh, gives machines intelligence that enable machines to see, to hear, and even to communicate like humans. And machine learning cuts across AI and robotics and aims to learn from data and make predictions. Now, progress in AI is enabled by a convergence of, of three things. Algorithmic advances, very important. People not often talk about the explosion of data and um, uh, the increase in the power of computing, but without the algorithms, uh, we would not have anything. So these three pillars, algorithmic advances, data, and computing, are enabling uh, this huge uh, progress that we're seeing today in practically any field that has data. So all, all companies, all industries uh, that have data can uh, benefit. And, um, machine, and, and they benefit uh, due to machine learning, which refers to a process that starts with a body of data and then aims to learn a rule or make a prediction about um, future use of the data. And medicine is a great example of a field that can benefit. Uh, today, uh, machines can read more radiology scans in a day than a doctor will see in a lifetime. Think about that. Now, in a recent study, doctors and machines were given scans of lymph node cells and they were asked to label them cancer or not cancer. The humans made 3.5% error as compared to the machines 7.5% error. But working together, the doctors and the machines achieved 0.5% error, if, which you, if, if you think about it, it's a significant um, uh, reduction, it's a significant percentage reduction in the error. And it's extraordinary. Now, these techniques are currently employed uh, by the most advanced uh, treatment centers in the world. But imagine a day when all doctors have access to these um, techniques, doctors in rural areas or doctors that are overwhelmed with work and don't have time to stay on top of the latest and greatest clinical trials can offer their patients the most advanced results by taking advantage of uh, AI um, yeah, solutions uh, that will in principle bring the most relevant information uh, to the patient for the doctor to make the decision. Now, machines and people working together can do so much, um, so much more. In finance, um, I like to think about the machine as kind of an intern running around and doing errands for you. And when you find a, uh, when, when the intern finds a good pattern or something interesting, that pattern is brought up to the human to act on, to make a decision about. And, um, 
And so uh, thinking about uh, uh, using these techniques to improve uh, the conversation between uh, people, to improve um, how you organize a portfolio, or to even make a prediction of what might happen uh, to the market are extraordinary um, uh, possibilities. And if you bring uh, blockchain uh, into the whole system, then you ensure that uh, all the processes uh, done by the machine um, can be checked, can be trusted. Uh, one more example, machines and people working together form better lawyers. Uh, so we're processing internet and email have already revolutionized how we draft documents, how uh, we look up information, how we exchange information. And the next wave of technologies, uh, which is getting really, really good, is natural language understanding. And with natural un language understanding, we are able to get machines to uh, read and and remember and uh, interpret entire libraries of documents. And so think about how useful that is for lawyers who need to, um, who need to know stuff about thousands and thousands of documents that are all very large. And so um, um, again, the idea is that the machine could bring the right, uh, the right information at the right time. And yet machines are not able to be lawyers because they cannot write compelling briefs, they cannot um, counsel clients, and they cannot um, persuade judges, but they might be able to support in predicting the decision that a lawyer might take. So my last example is uh, about uh, traffic, and um, this is actually from my research group. Uh, we built a new algorithm that matches supply and demand. And uh, this can be applied to any field um, where this is a problem. We applied it to the traffic in uh, New York City. And we have shown that um, with our algorithm, we can reduce the number of, of taxis required to meet the 400,000 plus taxi uh, ride requests a day with 3,000 vehicles. So think about getting rid of 11,000 taxis that are constantly roaming. So the taxis are not like my car. My car drives to my parking garage, stays there for 10, 11 hours, and drives back. But taxis provide constant movement in the city. And um, the catch is that these 3,000 cars, if you're taking a ride, let's say I'm going from here to the airport to La Guardia, if somebody is at the, uh, at the street corner and is also going to La Guardia, I have to make room for that person in the car, and, um, and I, I can't, but uh, I, I only get to share with up to four people. Uh, up to three people, four people total. Um, so think about the benefits to the city in terms of traffic, in terms of uh, lower pollution, and in terms of noise. And all this um, introduces only um, less than three minutes uh, delay in arriving at your destination, and this does not take into account the improved traffic you get by removing 11,000 cars from the roads. So all of these, um, uh, all of these uh, examples are, um, are extraordinary, and many of the advances you hear about in machine learning today are due to a technique called deep neural networks. And in deep neural networks, you have, um, you have a large, very large um, computer networks, usually with millions of nodes, and uh, millions of uh, manually labeled data items are presented to the network to figure out the weights of the nodes inside the network. And so for instance, in the case of a network that processes images, uh, a person might label this picture as beach, palm tree, and sea. And this is so that when another similar image gets presented to the network, the network says, ah, this is a picture of a beach. Okay, so this, um, this process with images works in two steps. Uh, given a photograph, uh, the network has to find out which pixels go with what objects. This is called image segmentation, and we have very good algorithms to do that automatically. Now, once you have segmented the image, you have to, rec uh, you have to add uh, labels to the objects recognized in the image, and uh, this is actually very uh, challenging. So, um, for instance, in this case, you might want to say you have a building, sky, and car, and you can do the same thing uh, with more images and even more images. And when it comes to labeling images, this is how it's done. So when it comes to labeling images, lots and lots of people sit uh, across the world and manually say, this is a car, this is a building, this is a road. So when we think about machine learning, uh, we have to consider what it means for the machine to learn. So for instance, when we say that 
the network has learned that this is a picture of a beach. What this means is that the pixels that form this picture look the same as the pictures, I'm sorry, as the pixels in other images that a human being said this is a beach. The system has no idea uh, what the beach represents, doesn't know what we do with it. Do we eat it? Do we drink uh, it? Do we play on it? What do we do with the beach? Um, how does the beach feel? What, what, what is the purpose of the beach? How much does it weigh? None of this uh, is part of what the system learns. And it's important to remember this because uh, I, we tend to anthropomorphize machines. And when we say the machine has learned, we tend to imagine what a human uh, might have learned uh, at the same time. So it's good to keep in mind um, these, uh, these issues. Furthermore, Neural networks are not perfect in how they uh, produce their results. So have a look at these two pictures, the two pictures of, uh, of two dogs. Do these dogs look the same to you? Yeah, they look the same to me too. Uh, but in fact, they're slightly different. Uh, the second picture was obtained by injecting a little bit of air. And you can see the noise that was added to the picture. We can't, uh, we can't uh, detect that with a naked eye. And yet, this little error is enough uh, to trick the network from saying this is a dog to saying that the second picture is an ostrich. And if I play around with the shape of the uh, error, I could get the second picture to be a car or a chair or anything I want. So while machine learning is making great progress, it's really important to keep perspective on uh, what it can and cannot uh, do for us. Uh, furthermore, have a look at this, uh, at this video. So this is a video of a child, an 18-month-old child, that's watching the scene for the very first time. Um, it's watching the scene, for, has never seen this, uh, this scene. And look at what this child does. The child has figured out that the adult needed help and has figured out an action to support the adult with help. Our machines are not able to do anything close to this. But this is an important and interesting grand challenge for the future of artificial intelligence and computation. Can we understand what is going on inside the brain of this 18 months old and create machines um, that, uh, that are engineered uh, for um, similar uh, levels of cognition, for, for similar uh, cooperative behavior? So machine learning is changing the world, and it's enabling so many extraordinary applications, but there are significant challenges. Fields that have data, uh, that have lots and lots of data benefit much more than fields that, that don't. Uh, so obtaining massive data sets is a challenge. The, uh, the, um, uh, uh, the image data sets um, uh, contain tens of millions of images. In fact, image recognition took off uh, about five years ago when uh, ImageNet uh, reached about 10 million images. Today it's much higher. Uh, data labeling is also a challenge because these tens of millions of data points have to be manually uh, labeled. Um, and then it's important to know that the results that come out of machine learning systems are not easily explainable nor generalizable. Um, finally, your answer is only as good as the data you have to train your network. And so if your data has bias in it, then your uh, results, uh, the results of the network will have bias. And we have to keep in mind what it means to learn. A few more challenges. Most of today's machine learning solutions are one-off solutions. And machine learning is usually done by experts only. So the program that plays AlphaGo with you is not going to be able to play chess or poker with you, uh, whereas a human would very naturally switch from one to the other. Also, just crunching the data does not mean you have knowledge. And making compl complex calculations does not mean you have autonomy. And so we have to keep in mind um, where are the, the benefits, and, and we have to think how, what problems should we work on in order to expand the capabilities of, the, uh, of these uh, techniques. Uh, still, we have a lot of opportunities with the technology we have today, as we, uh, as we have seen in the area of medicine, of uh, transportation, of finance, uh, of law. And these opportunities are around personalization and customization. 
around uh, using uh, natural language to interpret uh, knowledge, to interpret what is in our libraries and to bring that information at our fingertips. And all together uh, with machine learning, we can really increase the quality and uh, the efficiency of the time we spend doing uh, various tasks, mostly low-level tasks, routine tasks. But this is all about machines and people working together. So let me switch gear and, um, and say a few words about autonomy in motion. And as I think about this, I observe that our world has been so changed by computation. Just try to imagine a day in your life without your smartphone, without the web and everything they enable. Uh, no social media, no um, online shopping, uh, no uh, email and uh, texting, um, no digital media. It's, it's incredible to think about what this um, might be like. And, but I will tell you that 20 years ago, which I remember, we didn't have any of this. Okay, so in a world so changed by computation that's helping us with all these different tasks, what might it look with robots helping us with physical work? So I believe that autonomous driving is absolutely going to ensure that there will be no road fatalities. And it will give our parents and grandparents much higher quality of life in their retirements, and it will give all of us the ability to go anywhere, anytime. It is not a matter of if, it is a matter of when, in my opinion. So how much work should we be able to, uh, to offload to machines? So imagine driving home from work, knowing that your car has the intelligence to keep you safe and the smarts to make that ride fun. And let's say you have to pick up supplies for dinner. Uh, your car pulls over at the nearest grocery store uh, where you hand uh, the dinner menu to a robot at the door. This robot connects with your home and the home figures out what items you're missing. And a few minutes later, a box uh, gets presented to you by another robot. And when you get home, um, you hand the box to your kitchen robot. And you might even let your children um, help with, uh, with cooking because even though they make a mess, your uh, home cleaning robot will clean up the mess. Okay, now I know, you might, uh, I know what you might be thinking. You might be thinking that this sounds like one of those cartoons about the future that never comes to pass. Um, but that future, in my opinion, is not that far off. Uh, today, robots have become our partners in domestic and industrial settings. They work side by side with um, doctors in hospitals. Uh, they work side by side with workers uh, on the factory floors. They mow our lawns. They vacuum our pools. They even milk our cows. And in the future, they will do so much more for us. But in order to get to this future, we really need to build the science of autonomy. We need to improve our robots, and that means making robots uh, that are much more capable of figuring things out in the world, uh, making the whole process of creating robots faster, and making the process of interacting between, uh, interaction between robots and people uh, much more intuitive. Now, this, the first two are very important because, uh, the, uh, because each, each machine is made of a body and a brain. And um, for any task, the machine has to have the body that is capable of that task and the brain that is capable of controlling the body to do the task. A robot that, um, uh, that rolls on wheels is not going to be able to fly, nor is it going to be able to climb stairs. So you see the body and the brain um, together are very important in thinking about machines. Um, so let me spend uh, the rest of the uh, next segment talking about um, some examples of making better brains, better bodies, and better user interactions. Uh, let me start uh, with brains. And uh, I will say that today robots have a limited ability to figure things out. Most of their uh, interactions are fairly carefully specified, and um, in some cases you have limited adaptation. Uh, but general, but, but robots do not have a general ability of figuring out what is happening around them. And I would like to use um, the uh, example of self-driving cars uh, to illustrate this point. Um, this is how, um, this is the, um, uh, recipe for making a self-driving car. It's a recipe that's used by all the companies and most research uh, um, groups around the world. 
Um, so autonomous driving usually works in a closed environment. In the first phase, the robot drives on every road in the environment, makes a map, and that map is then used to plan paths and execute the paths when uh, ride requests uh, happen. So here's how you might take your own car and turn it into a robot, if you like. You start with your car, uh, you add sensors, usually laser scanners and uh, cameras, and uh, then you write some code. You write some code to make maps, to identify obstacles in the maps and, um, and to label what they are. And you also write uh, um, code to figure out uh, where the new uh, obstacles that were not there when the, uh, when the map was made are located. And then these maps can also be uh, used in real time uh, to help the robot figure out where it is because using sensors, uh, the robot makes a profile of the road uh, in, uh, at, the, at, the, uh, at the current moment and compares that with a map. Um, this allows the robot to figure out where it is. And then planning and control enables the robot to figure out how to go from one location to another and how to execute that pass. Okay, so this is the recipe. So, um, um, and by the way, this is uh, one of our most recent cars at MIT. We have a whole suite of uh, uh, vehicles for autonomous driving, ranging from wheelchairs, golf carts, and uh, cars. And they were all done with the recipe I showed you. Now, here is the problem. So generally, the sensor pi uh, uh, pipeline for autonomous driving has a bunch of steps. And the steps in the middle are usually very carefully um, and manually fine-tuned. For every instance, we, uh, we usually put code or we, uh, we specify the parameters that are needed in order to cope uh, with that instance. And uh, this necessarily limits uh, what the robot is able to do. And in particular, it is very hard to deal with nighttime driving. It is very hard to deal with situations where we do not have uh, maps uh, for the road. And it is very difficult to deal with rainy or snowy weather. Now, rain and snow is actually um, a deeper problem because the sensors we have today um, do not work well in rain and snow. So what can we do? Well, here comes machine learning, um, where instead of manually configuring everything that goes in the planning and reasoning system of a car and trying to anticipate all possible road situations that would come to the car, what we can do is um, we can try to learn uh, uh, how to drive by watching a human how to drive. And in our uh, research, uh, we are asking whether it is possible to learn how to steer the car by looking at single images of the road and watching what a human driver has done in those instances. So the answer is yes, it is possible to make driving more flexible. And uh, here is our car that's taking a first ride on a country road after being trained uh, by human drivers driving in Cambridge, um, which is very urban as compared to this road. And so uh, in red and blue, you see what the car should be doing and what the car thinks it should be doing. And you can see that the red and um, uh, blue arrows um, are very close together for the short, uh, shorter distance, but they, are, uh, they get further apart uh, as you go further out, but eventually they converge. And to be honest, I'm really delighted by, uh, by this first uh, drive of our car. If I think about my own first drive, it was not this smooth. Uh, so I am uh, I'm very encouraged uh, by the possibility of using machine learning to move away from having to manually code all the parameters that go in the reasoning engine of a, of a uh, robot. Now, we can do similar we can pose similar questions uh, with respect to other robot tasks. Uh, so a similar approach uh, was done to teach this robot um, how to do this task. And I might ask you, how many robots does it take to screw in a light bulb? And in this case, um, the answer is one, but it needs machine learning and it needs uh, soft hands. And I will tell you in a second um, what, uh, what those soft hands are. If you look at these uh, robot hands, they're very compliant. They look a lot like uh, the human hands, uh, unlike today's industrial manipulators, um, which are very rigid and, um, uh, and uh, hard. So the other thing to notice is that uh, the robot grasps 
uh, the bottom using one type of uh, grasp and the, the bulb using a different one. So how should the robot learn how to do that? This is a very important uh, aspect of grasping and uh, manipulation. And it turns out that a very similar approach to the one we have uh, developed for the cars uh, can be used to learn how to grasp uh, objects. And this, can be, um, and this can be used to teach a robot the approach direction so should I go this way or this way or this way? And also the pose of the gripper um, when the robot grasps. And what's kind of exciting about grasping, uh, especially with soft fingers, is that soft fingers wrap around the objects they are uh, grasping. So the, the soft fingers do not need to know accurate models of what it is that they're, get, uh, they're going for. And, um, and also, uh, with soft fingers, we don't need to know exactly the location of the object, so we can do uh, much more compliant, much more error-tolerant um, behaviors. Furthermore, what matters mostly is the aspect ratio uh, of, the, of the object we are trying to do. So it turns out that for this particular approach to grasping, we do not need millions of examples uh, to, to train the robot. We just need the examples of the critical um, aspect ratios that result in different approach directions and in different poses. And if you specify that, then any object that fits in the enclosing uh, box of that aspect ratio is in some sense considered trained for that particular task. So here it is, um, you, can see, um, you can see the robot um, apply um, using different approach directions and using different, um, uh, different grasp poses. And this was all trained using not 10 million examples, uh, but using a very small uh, data set. Uh, but again, the data set represented classes of different possibilities for grasping. Um, so you see, it's very exciting to think about bringing uh, machine learning uh, into robot control systems, because through machine learning, uh, we are really advancing, um, advancing and moving Moving away from, uh, from uh, manually uh, uh, coding all the parameters that go in the brain. And I should tell you that, in fact, Manuela has been uh, quite a pioneer in this, uh, in this. She figured this out way before the rest of the world. So Manuela has been telling us to do this for many, many years. Um, so I'm, I'm, very, uh, I'm very excited and optimistic about the possibilities of making the robots much more capable of figuring things out uh, in their uh, surrounding environments. Now, let me uh, say a few things about the robot bodies, because as I said earlier, uh, the robot really a robot really needs to have a body capable of the task that the robot has to do. And right now, I would say that um, designing new robots uh, is kind of the way um, things were with programming before we invented the compiler. So every robot is designed from scratch. Every robot um, uh, is designed in a very bottom-up way, uh, way. And we have mostly spent the last 60 years of industrial robotics thinking about robot bodies that are in either inspired by the human form, so humanoids or robot arms, or um, robots on wheels. And occasionally, we had some inspiration from nature. Um, but nature is so much broader. There are so many more things we can keep in mind in terms of uh, robot uh, bodies and shapes. And so a question is, can we speed up how we design and we fabricate new robots? Can we imagine a future uh, where anybody can make a robot? So let's take Alice, for example. Alice, and, and let's say we want to give Alice the ability to automate tasks in her home. And um, Alice works, so let's say Alice wants a robot to play with her cat while she's at work. Well, to do so in this um, near future, Alice could head to a new type of store called 24-hour robot manufacturing, where equipped with an intuitive design, Alex could, uh, Alice could figure out um, the shape of a machine she wants for the robot, and once she settles on the design, the store could make the, the robot uh, overnight for a very low cost. And now the cat has a playmate. Okay, so how crazy is this idea? Can you imagine a future where we could specify the function of the robot? Let's say I want a robot to play chess with me. 
And from this natural language specification, can we imagine using natural lang uh, language understanding to parse the specification, to identify what behaviors are needed for playing chess? We have to be able to uh, pick up a piece, to move it from here to there, to not knock off uh, other pieces. And um, then using databases of, uh, of available mechanisms, synthesize a device that is able to do exactly the behaviors that are needed um, for the task. And then we'd like to use something very simple like printing uh, to create this robot. And uh, so here is the robot that plays chess with you. Now, this robot was not um, developed as starting with a natural language specification, but many parts of making this robot uh, were in fact automated. And if you're interested in how uh, it was done, I can, uh, I can tell you um, later um, in great detail. Um, but here's the general idea. If you have a body shape and you want to create um, uh, that body shape, um, you can um, use off-the-shelf technologies um, to turn a photo into a mesh, and then to take that mesh and unfold it, either by slicing it or by, um, by an, uh, an origami unfolding process, to the point where you end up with a flat representation of the face that can be folded into the 3D object. And um, with that, you can then create uh, a compilation system uh, that starts with a picture and creates an actual robot that um, turns that picture to life, uh, like this bunny. And I believe that with this approach, uh, we can stretch our minds to think about all sorts of objects becoming roboticized. Imagine if we can awaken many of the objects in our surrounding world and turning them into, um, into a, a type of robot, into a machine uh, that can exert um, um, uh, work for you. So for instance, we could ask ourselves, what might the Sydney Opera House look like if it were a robot? And this, can we have sound? Can we increase the sound? And this is what the Sid Sydney Opera House would be if it were a robot. get the Sydney Opera House to make itself? Um, well, we haven't quite uh, gotten to that point, um, but here's a robot that starts as a piece of plastic that was designed like in the case of the robot bunny, and when exposed to heat, this robot can uh, grow into a fully-fledged uh, three-dimensional object that can move around and uh, can, uh, can do all sorts of uh, interesting uh, things. Now, we can make these robots at any scale. But it turns out that even at the small scale that you see in this picture, which is centimeter scale, uh, these robots can do interesting uh, things for us. We are using, we're looking to use these kinds of robots, which we call origami robots, uh, to enable a, a better future for medicine, to enable the creation of many surgeons that will provide surgeries without incisions, without pain, without physical um, uh, infections. And um, the particular task, the particular surgical task uh, we looked at uh, is whether we can use such robots to remove button batteries that people accidentally ingest. And um, the, the reason button batteries are dangerous is because they are, um, the acid in the batteries uh, pierces a hole in the stomach very quickly. Like in a half an hour, you get, um, you get the battery to be fully submerged. So you want those out today, uh, you have to have um, surgery for that. But now imagine taking that little origami robot, uh, compressing it, and surrounding it uh, in, uh, in ice. So, so, uh, so putting it inside the pill-shaped ice, the patient could swallow the pill. When the robot gets in the stomach, the ice could melt, the robot could deploy, 
And uh, then with a little magnet embedded in the body, in its body, the robot could go and uh, remove the foreign object um, using uh, feedback from an fMRI-like uh, machine. So here is the robot, and here's how it goes, and it pulls the battery, and now it's, uh, the, the, the whole thing can be eliminated through the digestive system. And later on, the robot could be sent back in the stomach, um, and now the robot could be... Um, could, could serve as a, as a patch, or uh, it could have medicine in its, in its body, it, and it could be directed to the location of the wound to deliver the medicine in a very precise way. Think about doing that with cancers, where right now, today, you, have, uh, you expose your whole body uh, to the cancer medicine. So it's kind of exciting to also think about the fact that these robots are actually made out of food. So we think of robots as being made out of plastic or hard plastics or metals. This robot is made out of sausage casing, and uh, it's digestible. Nevertheless, it's still a robot. So there are so many possibilities for using these technologies to enable a future for medicine that does not require incisions for every precision, that does not uh, lead to the risk of infections and does not give physical pain. Now, I want to uh, spend the last uh, part about uh, robots uh, looking at machine interactions. And when we talk about machine interactions, uh, we usually talk about interactions between machines. And in fact, Manuela is quite an expert on this. She, she has been the reigning champion of, uh, of um, uh, RoboCup for many, many years where her machines worked together uh, to win against other machines. I'm going to let her uh, present next time on this topic. Today I will focus on intuitive interactions between machines and people. And uh, I want to go back to my autonomous driving uh, example. And during Q&A, we can talk about where we are uh, really with autonomous driving, um, because we are not ready for level five autonomy, but we are ready for some applications in level four autonomy. But another interesting application of all of that uh, know-how, all of those algorithms, uh, is uh, in aiding visually impaired people and blind people to experience the world in ways that is unprecedented. There are tens of millions, hundreds of millions of visually impaired people around the world. And today, the most they have is the white walking stick that gives them one point of information about the world. Close your eyes and try to imagine what it would be like to enter into this auditorium and find a seat and determine whether it is empty or not using a white walking stick. Well, in today's age of, uh, of technology, where we count our steps and um, we send machines to, uh, to other planets, we should be able to do better than the walking sticks. And here's my idea. So you take the technology of a self-driving car and you map it onto wearables. So you take the laser scanners and you make them into laser belts that are backed by vibrating motors. Then you take the cameras and you make them into cool necklaces. And then you sew all the computers and everything else inside the clothes. And with this, you have essentially the hardware of a system that can look at the world, map the obstacles in the world, and uh, give you vibration when you're close to an obstacle. So let's say I'm close to this wall, the side of my belt will vibrate. And also, through a braille buckle, the system could, be, could also talk to me. It could tell me words. So with this technology, you could then walk down um, Fifth Avenue and, and uh, describe the fabulous window displays. Uh, or you could, um, you could alert um, the person to uh, obstacles, or you could say, hey, your friend Alice is walking by, or there's a cat next to you. And um, so this is, um, this is actually very close, to this, this kind of solution is really close to being uh, used, to being deployed. And here's an example of, uh, uh, of an implementation on our um, uh, user at MIT, where the system of, uh, aids the user to walk down hallways, to go down steps without bumping into any obstacles. The system is able to guide the user to a bench where he could sit there and wait for the ducks and feed the ducks. This is, a, uh, this is a, 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 an incredible increase of quality of life. And so you see with AI and robotics, we really have the opportunity to make the world better uh, for, for many people. Um, with AI 
and robots, we can also um, uh, begin to dream about the future of manufacturing where robots are no longer separated from people on the factory floor. And here we show an example where our human is collaborating with a robot and using um, sensors that monitor muscle activity, um, the, the robot essentially um, adapts to what the human is doing. And so by uh, stiffening and relaxing the muscles, uh, the human can communicate to the robot to stiffen or relax its own uh, grip. So in this case, the muscles are stiff, the robot is stiff. In the previous case, the robot was uh, quite uh, limp. So we can, we can begin to think about interesting sensors that we could put uh, in, uh, um, on our bodies. And I suppose the ultimate question is, can we go directly from our heads to the machine? And the answer is, no, we cannot do that in general today. Um, the sensors we have available for that are EEG caps um, that are quite sparse, 48 sensors uh, distributed on, um, on a cap, and they measure um, uh, electric activity in your brain. And most of the times, uh, what you get from these sensors uh, is, uh, is really uh, uh, very complex and cannot be decoded. But it turns out that there is one signal uh, that uh, with machine learning we can detect quite accurately. And this is a signal we all make. It's not trained. It doesn't matter what language we think in. You know what the signal is? Okay, this is the you are wrong signal. It is called the error-related potential. It turns out the you are wrong signal is something very strong and profound that, uh, that we all feel. And it's a, it's a localized sensor, um, and uh, it, has a unique, um, uh, it has a unique profile, and it can be detected. So with a you are wrong signal, um, we, can, um, uh, we can watch machines, and we can tell whether they're performing well or not. And so to demonstrate that this is a possibility, uh, we have, uh, could you put the sound down? Um, so we, we can, uh, we can uh, watch robots and correct their mistakes in real time. These signals can be detected in 100 milliseconds. And here's a user that's watching a robot. The task of the robot is to sort paint can, cans in a bin labeled paint and wires spool in a bin labeled wire. The robot is presented these objects in a random order and then randomly goes one way or another. And so here the robot went to wire and then um, moved right back because the human said that is wrong. And here you see, so it went and, and the, the correction was done instantaneously. Here it went directly to paint and that was correct. Now here's the wire, it goes mistakenly to uh, the paint um, box and uh, the robot uh, gets, uh, gets directed by the person to shift over. So um, it is really exciting to think about a future where machines adapt to us rather than the other way around. Today's machines um, do not adapt to us. We actually have to code them. But imagine advancing our know-how, our technologies to the point where uh, we reach um, that place. It's not quite there yet. Okay, so um, we talked about AI. Uh, uh, and uh, its, um, yeah, its possibilities. We talked about robots and its possibilities. I want to address uh, an elephant that's always in the room when I talk about these technologies, uh, which is uh, jobs. And usually when I tell people what I do, I get one of two reactions. Either people start cracking jokes about Skynet and ask me when the robots will take over their jobs, or uh, people ask when their cars will become self-driving. Um, so I believe that, uh, of course, our cars will be self-driving too. I'm, I'm very excited about the technology, but we have to understand the fears of the first group. We have to understand how to provide alternatives for how to see things differently. And this starts with understanding that AI and robotics are tools. They are tools that are not inherently good or bad. They are tools. Um, uh, and um, they, they do what we choose to do with them. Uh, and today, they, mostly do, they can mostly do uh, routine, low-level things. Um, so if you think about uh, four classes of, um, of jobs in terms of how much uh, cognition and how much manual unskilled labor there is, uh, I will tell you that um, the jobs at the top and at the bottom are too hard for machines today. It is much easier to send a robot to Mars than it is to get that robot to clear a tabletop. And uh, likewise, um, 
uh, robots are not going to make the, the decisions uh, in finance or in medicine or in any other field. But even the jobs in the middle, like accountancy, where there's a lot of routine activity, even those jobs have critical aspects that cannot be done by machines. So for instance, the accountant has to meet with you and discuss with you, and that the machine cannot do. So it is better to think about um, what we can automate in, t in terms of the tasks that we do in than in terms of professions that uh, disappear. And here you see a, um, uh, an excellent study from McKinsey uh, that shows a variety of different uh, jobs and the amount of time people spend managing others, applying expertise, doing stakeholder interactions, unpredictable physical work, data collection, processing of data, and predictable physical work. It's, it turns out that the ta tasks that can be automated today with our level of technology are the data tasks and the predictable physical uh, work tasks. And I'm actually quite excited when I think about the future because um, we can spend a lot of time analyzing these graphs and thinking about what might go away, but it's very difficult for us to imagine what will come back. So for instance, in the, uh, in the 20th century, agricultural employment dropped from 40% uh, to 2%, but nobody predicted the growth in the service jobs. And similarly, um, when, the, uh, when the airline industry took off, the jobs in the airline industry uh, increased and the jobs uh, in the train industry uh, decreased. Um, so I would like to say that as we, as we advance technology, we create new jobs and we have no idea what those jobs might be. In fact, I'm sure most of you can remember 10 years ago. I remember very well 10 years ago. There were no smartphones. Uh, there was no social media. Uh, there was uh, no cloud. So all of these are sectors that are employing a lot of people um, today. These jobs did not exist uh, 10 years ago. So getting there, though, uh, requires that we think about uh, whether we train our kids with the right skills. And we have an education problem, both short-term and long-term. Long-term, if we start teaching computing, in fact, I like computational thinking and computational making, if we do this uh, from early on, um, then we will end up with, um, uh, with a graduating class in 10 years' time where everyone can participate in the IT economy. In the meantime, we can take lessons from companies like uh, BitSource, which is a startup in Kentucky, very successful startup. Uh, it's been training coal miners to become data miners. Um, and it's, uh, it's one of the great successes in Kentucky. So I'd like to end by a few reflections on our future with robots and machines. This is the first industrial robot. Uh, it is called the Un Unimate. It was introduced in 1961. By 2020, we will get to 31 million industrial robots, so from 1 to 31 million. These industrial robots are masterpieces of engineering. They can do so much more than people do. And yet they remain isolated from people on the assembly line because they're large and dangerous to be around. But in fact, in nature, organisms in nature are soft and compliant and much more dexterous. And, and so look at this, um, uh, this example of an octopus uh, bending and twisting to uh, escape um, through a narrow hole. hole. Or look at this, uh, look at this uh, gentle elephant that is able to pick up the banana from the child, and yet the elephant can use the trunk to fend off a competitor. We can begin to think about new materials and new approaches for making robots in a way that enables them to be safer to be around, in a way that is much more inspired by how nature forms its organisms. And I wanted to show this example of, um, of, one, of um, one of my beloved robots called Sophie. Um, and uh, here's Sophie swimming side by side uh, with, uh, with robots um, in a natural world. And if I didn't tell you that this was a robot, maybe you could indulge me and say, oh yeah, it looks like a real fish. <laughs> So with the development of soft materials, machines and materials are getting closer together with machines getting softer, more like materials, and materials getting much more uh, intelligent, uh, more like machines. And so this raises an interesting question. What is a robot? Uh, what, do, what kind of materials uh, we use uh, in order to make robots? And so I would like to propose that we should expand our view of what a robot is 
so that the next 60 years uh, will usher adaptive soft machines that could work uh, side by side with humans and could give us pervasive support of machines and form diversity. And here's how this future might look like. So imagine waking up, enabled by your personal assistant, that figures out the optimal time when you wake up and helps you organize the outfit you want um, to wear and also what you, might, um, what you might need for work. On your way to work, um, you walk by beautiful stores that display your own image uh, with the latest and greatest fashions. And when you walk inside the store, um, your body gets scanned and you get bespoke um, shoes and bespoke clothing uh, done right away. And materials that have uh, sensors and uh, computation embedded in them and the, even the ability to reprogram what they look like might even allow you to match your, um, uh, to match your outfit to your friend's outfit uh, you might come across uh, in, the, in the store. So here they're matching the outfits. And at work, intelligent rooms might notice that you're, you're stressing out over a meeting and adjust the temperature accordingly. And uh, intuitive, uh, intuitive design interfaces uh, might allow you to uh, connect with um, your colleagues uh, present virtually far away to design, let's say, the next um, flying car. And this flying car could be connected to the rest of the infrastructure and to your home uh, to, to, do the, to, to become the, uh, the ultimate assistant uh, in managing your uh, transportation and your chores. Uh, so for instance, um, in this case, uh, Alice's mother uh, gets the task to pick up some plants. And these plants are for Alice's grandmother who's planting a garden. Your packages could arrive delivered by robots, the garbage bins could take themselves out, uh, the bikes could have adaptive wheels that, uh, that give you just the right level of support um, when, you, um, when you want to uh, exercise. And while the robot digs in the garden, you can, uh, you can stop to, uh, to have a nice conversation with your grandmother. And when when the end of the day is near, after a good day, it is time for a bedtime story, which allows you to enter the story and interact uh, with a dragon. So these advances, uh, these advances in science, in the science and engineering of autonomy can create an extraordinary future for all of us with machines taking on uh, difficult, I mean, with machines taking on increasingly more difficult tasks. Uh, machines allowing us uh, to focus on what we find exciting and interesting and also, frankly, each other. Thank you very much.